Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar titled Roadmap to Automated Composites Manufacturing, brought to you by Composites World and sponsored by CG Tech. My name is Jeff Sloan, and I am the editor of Composites World. Today's webinar will focus on the transition from hand layup to automated composites manufacturing and seeks to make the benefits and considerations of such a transition apparent and therefore easier to navigate. This presentation will last about 35 minutes, followed by question and answer. If you have a question, you can type it at any time during the webinar in the question field of your GoToWebinar control panel. This webinar is being recorded and when complete will be made available to you via email from Composites World. This presentation will also be made available by CG Tech via email request. Contact information for our presenter will be provided at the end of the webinar. Our presenter today is Charlie Anderton. He's a Composites Product Specialist at CG Tech. Charlie's been involved with automated composites manufacturing as an NC programmer, a machine operator, manufacturing engineer, and project engineer. Prior to joining CG Tech, he held positions with Aurora Flight Sciences as Aurora Flight Sciences as a Six Sigma Greenbelt Manufacturing Engineer in Columbus, Mississippi. At CG Tech, he focuses on Vericut's composite applications product development as a composite product specialist. Charlie's worked with CG Tech uh, uh, CG Tech's composite product line as an end user since 2014 and in support of development since 2016. Charlie, it's all yours. Thank you, Jeff. Um, good morning or afternoon, uh, depending on where you are. As uh, Jeff said, I'm Charlie Anderton uh, with CG Tech, and today I'll be discussing the considerations and challenges that come along with adopting automated composites processes. We'll cover a brief introduction and some terminology, followed by a discussion of why composites automation might make financial sense and what should be considered when selecting a machine type. This presentation is applicable to anyone considering expanding manufacturing from hand layup methods to those including automated placement of composites material. For that reason, I'd like to cover some basic terminology up front. We will collectively refer to AFP, which stands for Automated Fiber Placement, and ATL, which stands for Automated Tape Layup, as ACM, which stands for Automated Composites Manufacturing. We are specifically excluding fiber winding processes from this discussion due to its comparatively more direct and straightforward process. The main difference between AFP and ATL is the width of material being placed. AFP material is more narrow, typically ranging from an eighth of an inch to a half of an inch, and ATL, which can be as wide as 12 inches. There are some inherent challenges specific to more narrow or wider materials, which we will touch on uh, a bit in a bit to further differentiate between the two processes. An add is the process of adding a single instance of material to a form, and as you probably could have guessed, a cut is the process of cutting a single instance of material. PAT stands for preliminary article testing and consists of machine validation and testing, typically on the machine tool builder's facility. This is the first instance that the machine has put through its paces and feedback from this event fuels the rest of its development and changes that the machine undergoes. The FAT stands for the final article testing and is the final validation and check the machine goes through. The FAT is done with the machine installed at the customer site, is tested in the real conditions it's expected to perform in, and a successful FAT is needed to buy off the machine. Lastly, steering is the process of guiding the material in a specific non-straight direction. This can be achieved through applying sufficient compaction pressure and heat to the material that allows adherence to the layup form while having internal stresses to the material. In this picture here, you can see the wavy material on the left. This is steered to form a sort of a rainbow effect. One last note, our discussion will use many examples from the aerospace industry, the industry that's currently most supportive of ACM. This has a lot to do with the relatively slower production rates in this industry 
compared with, say, automotive. This industry's demand for performance and weight reduction, as well as the aerospace's uh, industry's ability to stomach higher material costs. Other industries are experimenting with ACM, again, such as automotive, but have yet to openly welcome ACM into their production lines, primarily due to the higher material costs causing savings resulting from scaling effects not to be realized. Another hurdle in the automotive industry involves the relative small and complex size of their parts when compared to broad, wide wing panels, spars, and fuselages. So for now, let's keep our eyes to the sky. Why ACM? Companies are able to produce large primary structures out of composites with timelines that simply cannot stand up to manual placement of material. Here we see inside the Everett based Boeing Composite Wing Center. Both of these machines are producing parts for the 777X project. In addition, complex shapes are possible with repeatable and reliable automated processes in ways that surpass manual material placement. Here we have a massive pressure ver vessel and a wing skin panel. We will get into the details of the benefits that ACM bring momentarily. <clears throat> In the case of AFP, the end effector, the part of the machine that the material is fed from, has multiple toes of material. These are slit into the widths that we mentioned before, and an end effector can have as few as one toe to up to 24 or more toes. In the cases of ATL, courses are made up of one or more tapes instead of toes. Toes or tapes, depending on which process you're using, make up courses. Multiple courses make up plies, which, when multiple plies are on the same layer of a previously placed material, make up a sequence. Multiple sequences make up a part, like this fuselage panel for the Airbus A350. One reason companies consider HCM is due to the impressive ability to lay down an extensive amount of material on a form at a rapid rate. One of the most obvious reasons why Boeing chose to build the front and rear spars of the 777X wing with ACM instead of a hand layup process is a massive 236-foot wingspan, which represents a massive undertaking. By utilizing the strengths of AFP, Boeing designed and initiated efforts to accomplish this monumental feat. Boeing isn't the only company to understand that in the right setting, ACM is better and financially superior in the long term when compared to hand layup for numer numerous reasons. Another reason why manufacturers typically seek out ACM is for the same reason anyone chooses automation. Increased throughput, better quality, and reduction of labor costs. While all of these apply to ACM, the greatest advantage in choosing automation is part reproducibility. Reproducibility becomes a real concern for manual processes like hand layup of composite parts. When numerous technicians are expected to interpret engineering drawings while placing material in the same exact location and direction again and again and again, many times that process falls short. Automation virtually eliminates this difficult feat. The responsibility for interpreting engineering flag notes and drawings no longer lies in the hands of a shop floor technician. Instead, the engineer dictates and analyzes pre-established machine paths before ever reaching the shop floor, thus eliminating potential waste of material and valuable machine time. The same NC program can be executed as many times as needed with virtually no variability. With automation software, such as CG Tech's Veracut Composite Programming, the manufacturing engineer possesses the ability to control spice lo splice locations, ply staggers, and material orientation as designed. Simulation software, such as Veracut Composite Simulation, allows engineers to simulate the part layup and machine motion in a virtual environment rather than wasting, again, costly machine uh, time and material. This creates a much more efficient and innovative method for creating composite parts. Let's say that you're now sold on the process of ACM in terms of being a benefit to your facility. Let's even say that you have management's approval to move ahead with selection of a machine vendor. How exactly do you choose? How do you compare one machine to another? 
due to the fact that one of the biggest benefits associated with ACM is the, re the rate of material placement, understanding how this rate is defined and marketed by machine tool builders is necessary to be able to accurately discern between machines. Two key metrics to be aware of are weight per time and distance per time typically given out in pounds per hour and inches per minute, respectively. While these metrics can help you compare machines and setups, it's important to understand caveats related to each. The pound per hour metric can easily be misconstrued by overlooking the processes and events that affect the machine, operators, and other support staff. A 100 pound part could be produced in two hours with a machine that can place material at 50 pounds per hour, right? Unfortunately, it's not that simple. Everything from material loading times to operator smoke breaks affects the total time taken to produce a part in a real manufacturing setting. Clarity on the distance per time metric is also needed. A machine might be capable of placing 24 inches of material per minute if it was placing flat, long shapes, but that rate could be reduced significantly when trying to place material in three dimensions over complex contoured shapes, which unfortunately make up a majority of real aircraft parts. Due to the comparative ease in quantifying a design part in weight compared to the distance required for a machine to lay it up, the weight per time will be more useful for the rest of our discussion. Most likely you'll find it's more useful in your case too, but it's important to know both metrics are relevant and important in certain circumstances. A convention of A, B, C, and D rates is used to help differentiate between what is factored into that specific rate. A rate is the rate that only takes into account time that the machine spends placing material. The A rate was used in the previous example of assuming a machine capable of placing 50 pounds per hour could build a part in two hours. The C rate is the most applicable rate in determining a realistic time taken to manufacture a part. It takes into account the time that the machine spends placing material plus downtime and dead time. Downtime refers to time which the machine is occupied and capable of fiber placing material but is not utilized. This is where inspection, rework, material change, or lamination compaction are factored in. Dead time encompasses time which the machine is occupied but incapable of fiber placing material. Software or mechanical problems, loading or unloading tooling within the work cell, shift changes, and breaks all contribute to dead time. A rate is the rate that machine builders sometimes advertise because it is the rate, because it is the fastest rate, and it's also the most flashy rate and because it encompasses specifically what they have direct control over, how fast the machine can place material. Because they have little to no control over everything else that's taken into account with C rate, it would not be realistic for them to advertise it. However, C rate does most closely fit the rate that you'll see on your shop floor. And because of that, knowledge and understanding of it is essential. Not only will it naturally affect operations and planning down the road, an understanding of these rates should influence machine selection. Given comparable A rates, machines could be down selected based on their contribution to down or dead time. How easy a tool is to load into a machine's work cell, how quickly material can be loaded onto the machine, how often maintenance is required, and other factors affect the C time or the C rate that you will see on your shop floor. There are processes that affect the total time taken to manufacture a part, but that are not strictly part of the manufacturing process, namely quality and inspection. Reducing the time of these necessary other processes will help reduce the overall time taken to produce the part. Furthermore, inspection accounts for the largest input in determining the total time a part is within an ACM work cell. In the case of, in this case of the 787 fuselage barrel, inspection and rework time took two to three times as long as the material layup. Simply purchasing the fastest machine, however you choose to quantify that, is not the complete answer to making parts faster. Every ply that is placed must be inspected for defects 
FOD, and placement accuracy. Each end of each toe in each course, in each ply, in each sequence must be verified for correct placement. For large parts, manually inspecting all of these locations takes considerable time. In order to help reduce the time for quality inspection and rework, many machine builders include support systems with their machines such as a laser projector and a scanning profilometer. One or more laser projectors can help inspectors quickly identify where the nominal ply boundary exists as well as help technicians rework any toes by identifying the nominal placement of toe edges and ends. The use of laser projectors is common practice in hand layout processes for composites. The difference between the manual and automatic uses of laser projectors is that oftentimes the projectors used in conjunction with ACM machines are actually mounted on the machine axes and can provide information for multiple locations within the work cell because their position can change as the axis position changes. Manual inspection can become automated inspection. Scanning profilometer also helps reduce inspection time. Either mounted on the same motion platform as the end effector or another nearby motion platform that shares the same work cell, the part can be scanned either simultaneously to material being placed or just after the placement process. Generated data is compared to the nominal layout and used to identify overlaps, gaps, bridging, twisted tape, splices, and other defects. As mentioned before, one of the advantages in moving to automation is reliability. This reliability is important to both the material placement and the inspection process. In a 2014 study, recovery time from a processed failure of dropped toes was averaged to an approximate nine minutes with a concurrent time of part rework estimate at 15 minutes. Over the full three-day part build, the summation of time spent recovering from these issues was tallied at 15 hours. It's easy to see that stressing machine reliability is important. An industry standard is one failure for every 3,000 ad cut events. Although several tier one machine vendors like ElectroImpact and mTORES are already outpacing that considerably, with some machines obtaining one error in 16,000 ad cut events. The key is, of course, maintenance. Considering the previous example of inspecting the 787 fuselage section, a manual inspection process seems daunting when considering the perfection required in detecting, for example, 60 process failures in 180,000 events. Because of the magnitude of this undertaking, supplementing or replacing a manual inspection process seems mandatory. The cost associated with adopting ACM is comprised of what must be added and what must be changed. Typically, a new facility is erected to house the new ACM machine. This is most often the case due to the thick foundation required to ensure the accuracy can be guaranteed, even while tons of machinery are rapidly moving about on top of it. Plus, not every manufacturer has the massive required footprint necessary to house such a large machine of these types just already laying about unused. In addition, software must be obtained to program and control the machine and any supporting systems. Changes must be made to personnel and across organizational lines. Transitioning to ACM requires a fundamental shift in part design that needs to be supported with experienced and knowledgeable leadership. Flow down to the rest of the organization requires personnel training, specification modification, and altered processes. Engineering, manufacturing, design, quality, and operation groups will all be affected by this change. An example of how manufacturing specifications needed to be adapted is this convergent zone seen here. A convergent zone is an area of the laminate that has enough contour that it causes the courses to converge. In this case, toes are dropped, which is another way of saying that a full complement of toes is not used in these areas as courses converge in order to reduce the amount of overlap between toes. In this picture, the red triangles represent gaps caused by toes being dropped as the toe-to-toe -to -toe overlap amount ex is exceeded by a specified threshold. Using a hand layup method for composite parts with complex curvature, 
There are a number of ways to drape the material over the form and obtain a surface with no material defect. However, for ACM, these convergent zones are necessary in areas of curvature that would cause material to wrinkle from excess steering. For all intents and purposes, this convergent zone has numerous gaps and overlaps. What differentiates these convergent gaps and overlaps from defects is that they are necessary, they're part of the design, and they're on purpose. Having manufacturing and quality groups that understand this key difference and other similar differences is vital to the success of ACM at your facility. An example of how tooling design needs to change can be seen above. A tool like this with wide flanges and an excess of tool material outside of the edge of the part is not only unnecessary, but in the case of ACM, presents a greater likelihood of tool and machine collision. These flanges might be useful for a hand layup process for technicians to place material or useful instruments on for easy access. But in the event of either converting a process from hand layup to automated or simply designing tooling for a new automated process, these excessive flanges increase risk of collision. Understanding the gravity of this process is critical to have realistic expectations and timelines either employing experts in the ACM field or contracting their expertise is vital to begin to foster the growth of knowledge that is required for the whole of ACM. There's a steep learning curve that comes along with automation and ACM is no different. Lastly, ensuring that management is completely on board with this transition period is vital. A typical implementation from machine vendor down select to running the machine at your facility or the FAT is 18 to 24 months. An organizational champion for this implementation is necessary to ensure focus is directed correctly for the entire duration of this period. A full account of expected costs, in addition to information from the machine tool builder about realistic part rates, can help aid potential ACM adopters in determining if ACM is financially beneficial for them as well as aid in the calculation of meaningful return on investment estimates. Understanding the considerations and assumptions that go into these expected costs ensures that they are well thought out. Now that we have an understanding of why it can be beneficial to transition to an ACM process, we must discuss the different types of ACM and the benefits and drawbacks inherent to each. As mentioned before, the most obvious difference between AFP and ATL is the width of material placed on the form. This directly affects the parts producible with each process as well as the manufacturing edge of parts. One caveat of AFP is that there is a minimum length of piece that has to be placed each time. This is the distance between the nip point and the tape cutter module on the end effector shown here on the left. This parameter is different for each machine manufacturer and typically ranges between four inches to 12 inches. Each toe is cut perpendicular to the length of the toe. In addition, each toe's end is always perpendicular to the length. Here you can see that the AFP toes can be placed in several ways in regards to the red ply boundary. Because of the minimum length piece, this scrap material must always be placed somewhere. Understanding the best place for it is an important design consideration, as these minimum length pieces don't just appear on the edge of the part, as I've shown here, but also inside the part, should your part have internal smaller plies. One major drawback to ATL is the inability to steer such wide material. Here you can see material defects resulting from attempting to lay wide tape over a contoured surface. A major benefit to ATL is that tapes don't have to be cut perpendicular to their length. They can be cut on angles to help better match the ply boundary. This results in a clear near net shape or a closer near net shape. Furthermore, material acquisition costs are sometimes less due to the fact that material does not have to be slit into so many small widths. One significant drawback to ATL is that because the ends of the tape are custom cut to the ply boundary, if the beginning of a course's geometry doesn't complement the previous course's geometry, the material has to be scrapped until the new course's geometry can be produced. This can result in very high scrap rates. 
This is offset somewhat by the general faster or higher rate of material placement that ATL can bring because of its wider amount of material deposition. Furthermore, for some applications, a combined approach of AFP and ATL makes the most sense. Take this rectangular part, for instance. The middle dark gray material can be laid up with ATL with virtually no scrap due to the beginning and ends of courses complementing each other. In addition, ATL generally has a higher laydown rate than AFP, so this gray area could be produced faster than if placed with AFP. The corners of the part where this isn't the case can be placed with AFP with much less scrap than ATL would produce. There are several tier one machine vendors who offer machines capable of both ATL and AFP solutions that would be able to produce the part as indicated here. Beyond the choice between AFP and ATL, the next step in determining which machine solutions would best fit the process is addressing which machine platform which motion platform would be best suited for your part. Given an exceptionally large part, for example, with dimensions in a given direction of greater than 15 feet, an overhead gantry might be the best solution as seen here left. Typical configurations include linear X, Y, and Z axes with a C on B on A rotational axes mounted on the Z axis. Additional axes such as the second C axis our, our part rotator are beneficial in certain circumstances. If the footprint of the part is not immense, then a robot arm on a floor gantry is a common solution as seen here on the right. The robot configuration contains several advantages to the overhead gantry, not the least of which is cost. In most cases, robot arms require less floor space, infrastructure to operate, and less hardware costs when compared to large gantry machines. While stereotypes are sometimes less accurate than gantries, machine tool builders can overcome this with a variety of strategies. For instance, ElectroImpact replaces the stock internal gearing with in-house developed systems and adds additional motion control feedback on the robot's joints. Unfortunately, there's no one-size-fits-all for ACM. Everything is dependent on your program, on your part, and on your situation. A careful consideration of each question posed here and others is necessary to determine, to accurately determine the benefits you may realize by utilizing ACM. As we mentioned earlier, consideration should be given to reducing inspection time through supporting systems of laser projectors, scanning profilometers, and other auxiliary items like part rotators and head changing stands. The impacts that these systems have on the overall reduction in production time is drastic, and a supportive management should be encouraged to pursue their value for your part and program. Progressive companies from all over the world already reap the rewards that ACM offers. By adopting these new processes, these businesses prove to understand not only the benefits that automation brings for the future, but also how their current processes can be improved upon. The transition from non-automated composites manufacturing to automated processes is not trivial. However, manufacturers can realize, that can realize the benefits that AFP or ATL can, can leverage these tools to reduce manufacturing time on existing programs and open up the possibility of many other future programs. Complementing the automated manufacturing process with other automated processes like inspection further compounds the advantages inherent to automation. Having realistic expectations about not just machine rate, but machine implementation is key at all organizational levels in order to create achievable timelines and delivery schedules. So now I just want to talk a little bit about CG Tech and what we can offer. CG Tech is headquartered in Irvine, California with numerous offices worldwide in South America, Europe, and Asia. We've long found success in simulation and, verif cut for, and verification for metal cutting programs while offering composites programming and simulation tools since 2004. We offer a variety of software solutions. The most relevant to our discussion today is, of course, the VeriCut Composites Programming and VeriCut Composite Simulation Packages, the VCP and VCS. VCP and VCS offer a suite of tools for the design manufacturing, and quality engineers. 
Our software is completely machine independent, and we have success working with programs and simulate a number of machine vendors, including equipment from ElectroImpact, Torres, KUKA, Accudyne, Thieves, Automated Dynamics, and more. You might think it's a straightforward process to take a part design and turn it into something that can run on the machine. Unfortunately, that's not really the case. You have to take the design and you have to define ply boundaries and the tooling required that is then utilized by programming software to define exactly how those boundaries are filled in. At this point in VCP, the design is still somewhat machine independent. So we take a machine specific post processor that we custom tailor to each machine configuration and create machine specific programs. This is where a good working relationship with machine tool builders becomes important as in most cases, we actually write out G and M code that's run on the machine. But it would be unwise to run an untested and unverified NC code on a multi-million dollar machine, potentially risking collisions, errors, and mistakes. By simulating the actual NC code and the entire process, users are able to detect potential collisions in the risk-free environment of a virtual work cell. Comparisons between the design and produced part are easily made and verified. This ability to feed data back into the design and programming is invaluable in order to produce quality and exact composite parts. Multiple updates, including new features, are offered several times a year. Uh, our machine is machine independent, so for customers with more than one machine brand, we can control and verify all of them. We offer a single point solution that eliminates the need for training in multiple different softwares repeat, uh, you don't have to repeat work previously done, and you don't have to try to maintain multiple software versions and types. We pride ourselves on our customer service and have enhanced the software in the past to meet customers' needs. And we identify a need that benefits one customer, but that would benefit other customers as a whole, we bundle that with future software release to support the user base um, in its entirety. We offer on-site remote training around your schedule Skills learned for one part in machine transfer easily to others. Like I mentioned before, an enhancement initiated by one customer is passed on to others through updates, while we also offer customer solutions based on customer needs. There are a lot of things that the nominal design doesn't always take into account, like fiber direction at every point, minimum length of material pieces, convergence, variation from nominal and corner thickness, et cetera. Even designs that do attempt to include this information are often only approximations because they're just the design. The more accurately we can simulate the actual process, the better chance we have of, of avoiding undesirable results. By simulating and analyzing material placement by the actual machine in C code, the results are much more accurate to what quality inspectors will find on the real shop floor. Here we have a picture of our simulated layup of minimum pieces of material on a corner of a piece and a picture of the actual material place to show how accurately we are able to simulate the real layup. VCP not only allows you to program the head path, course information, and course linking strategies, it also allows you to verify several key manufacturing parameters, just as they would appear on the actual part. Parameters like fiber orientation, roller compaction, material steering, boundary condition, and convergence zones can all be measured and analyzed. Further, VCS can be used to verify several aspects of the entire laminate layup. Reports can be generated to quickly share the information from the simulation uh, on the producibility with management, design engineers, and more. So I think at this point, uh, Jeff, I'm going to turn it back over to you uh, for any questions. All right, Charlie, thank you very much. I appreciate that. So uh, right now we do have time for a question and answer. So uh, attendees, if you do have a question, now it's time to ask it. You can uh, type your question in the question field of your GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, also, we've already had one question about whether or not this presentation will be available as a PDF. The answer is yes, and uh, you can contact um, you can contact Charlie directly, uh, his email's here on the screen, contact him directly to request that PDF. Also, as a reminder, this 
webinar is being recorded and you'll have a, you'll be provided a link to that when it is over. Um, all right, so let's get to the first question, Charlie, and it is this. Uh, how do you suggest that tool designers accommodate for minimizing tool machine collision? Uh, flanges are used for vacuum bagging and other ancillary needs in molding. So that's a good question. Um, and, and you do, I wasn't suggesting earlier that you need to eliminate all flanges because um, as, as the person uh, brings up, they are uh, important. Um, but simply minimizing those. Um, you know, whereas you only have the amount of flange that you need for those vacuum bags, um, as opposed to the several additional inches of material that was shown in the, in the picture. Um, so that is um, one of the biggest things, but also uh, taking into account and considering uh, what your machine is actually capable of. Um, some of the machines are not able to fit down into certain um, female tools or certain radiuses uh, involved in that, or radii involved in that. Um, so keeping that in mind just in general with designing the parts uh, is important as well. Okay, great. Next question is this, apart from the high capital costs of the equipment, why is AFP ATL more expensive? Ignoring the equipment cost, I thought the cost per part would be lower because it's out of autoclave, there's no waste, no consumables, no temperature controlling store, controlled storage, et cetera. Um, I, well, there, there are a variety of material systems you can use with AFP and ATL, some of which are out of autoclave, um, but by definition, uh, all AFP and ATL are not out of autoclave. Um, you can have, like I said, material systems that are and material systems that are not. Um, and, and, uh, you still need um, environmental control in terms of material storage and all that. So um, there are some of some similarities in, in terms of how you process the parts, um, and it's not just uh, it's not not quite that easy. Okay. Next question is this: Can you see ACM reaching more complex geometries in the future, and what are the real barriers to this happening? I think so, um, and I think that's that's actually one of the keys to um, breaking into other industries like the automotive um, and either, even just other uh, parts within the aerospace industry. I think probably the, the biggest challenge to overcome that um, is uh, being able to accurately control a machine and having the knowledge of how to control a machine such that you know, you've got this giant machine moving around a complex shape, um, ensuring that um, everything is, is rotated and accessed um, as needed to place the material over the complex contour and uh, keeping you know, the rest of the machine out of the way. Um, some, some, of the some of the parts that we've seen um, and helped some of our customers with, just keeping the machine out of its own way is one of the biggest challenges. Um, furthermore, I, I think figuring out strategies for uh, placing material over very tight radii, um, whether that is the radii uh, or the radius of a, a spar, um, or or something else like a like a duct, um, figuring out the best approaches to get the material to adhere, um, but also just um, making sure that it adheres in a um, defect-free way uh, is key. Okay. Uh, next question is somewhat related, so maybe you've already answered it. Will ACM make it into automotive? If so, where do you see it succeeding? I, I think it would have to succeed. Um, the biggest key with automotive, I think, is bringing the cost of the material down. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, when you're using something like aluminum or steel with relatively lower material costs, if you're able to ramp up um, the rate of production of whatever you're building um, high enough, then you're able to realize the scaling effect uh, inherent to that. But because the uh, material is so expensive, um, carbon fiber is so expensive compared uh, to some of those metals, um, it's, even if you scale it up rapidly, you're still paying a lot for material. Um, so I, I think that um, it would be most successful in areas that maybe boutique areas of the, the automotive industry um, that did have a decent amount of rate of production that would warrant something um, maybe a bit faster than hand layup, but not something that was so 
uh, so high that, that the material cost would just be prohibitive. And I think that's one reason why aerospace has found success there. Okay, great. Next question is this. How can, uh, how can companies best use the automated inspection data in the manufacturing analysis and downstream pro processes? I think the key is, um, number one, identify uh, any, any defects so that, uh, so that the inspectors can go out there and fix them. Uh, and then using that data to identify why was the defect there in the first place. You know, if this is not the first time you've run a program and you're, you've got data assembled for, for each time you've run it and you're noticing sort of the same sort of, of defects in, in the same area at the same time of the laminate, then that would obviously be indicative of, of a different kind of problem. Um, maybe there's there's uh, some hardware uh, issues or timings that could need to be ironed out. You know, maybe that is, is a way that your um, your programming approach could be improved upon. Um, but I think using that to feedback to start eliminating some of those defects instead of just being able to identify and fix them uh, is, is a great way to use that data. Okay. Uh, next question, do the machines that do both ATL and AFP use two end effectors or is a single head used for both? Yeah, so typically they will use uh, separate end effectors for, um, for each width of material. Um, essentially they have one for let's say AFP and then when they need to use ATL they will go drop off that end effector, pick up the other end effector for the wider material and then begin placing with that. All right, next question. Uh, what general best practices in your experience are employed to achieve a better C rate? I think that um, anything that, that's factored into C rate that you can be proactive about, um, something as simple, like I said, is, is uh, you know, worker breaks. Um, I, I know not all workplaces uh, would allow something uh, like staggering work breaks. Um, but that's something that I, I've, I've done in, in my own practice um, that, you know, just as simple as staggering smoke breaks and lunch breaks, always keeping the machine running um, that extra hour of day um, or, or more, it, it actually ends up being more. So even if it, lunch is just an hour, um, you end up saving more time than that because anytime the shift changes or you start or you stop something, you're it takes a bit to ramp back up when you get back. It's not just instantaneous. Um, so, so being mindful of that um, and what you can be proactive uh, about uh, mitigating, going ahead and, and trying to do that. All right, good. Next question. Uh, what is typical operation support staff for ACM? For example, how many machine operators, machine maintenance team inspectors, and others run to a, others required to run a single machine? Um, Typically, uh, two technicians um, are required, two to three um, are required, one of which is, is the one that actually runs the machine. Um, depending on the part size, uh, two um, inspectors, quality inspectors might be sufficient, sometimes three or four. Uh, it's just a matter of, um, you know, how long you actually want to take with inspection. Um, you know, I've seen firsthand how laying up a, a ply can take 10 minutes and an inspection takes 30 or 40. Um, and it's just, it's a, it's a killer there, especially when it's just simply a fact that if you had another person, it would go a little bit faster. Um, apart from that, it's, you know, you need an NT programmer um, that, depending on your situation, could, could pull double duty as, um, as someone either running the machine or, um, you know, as, as, as uh, assisting as a technician there um, by doing the programming up front. Uh, ahead of time. So I'd say, you know, approximately four to six people. And if your part size is incredibly uh, bigger than that, then, then maybe more. Okay. Uh, next question is this. How does VCP and VCS handle laying up over a Nomex core? Is there an easy way to acknowledge when, the lower compact, when to lower compaction, tension, and heat per rapid change in geometry or presence of fragile material like core? So um, the key with laying up over core is is to understand um, exactly the how much compaction you can use, um, and and apart from uh, empirically testing that or having someone else with the knowledge already that can inform you of that, 
Um, you kind of just have to, to experiment with that. But w once you understand that, and once you know how much compaction you can use, um, you can vary the compaction pressure uh, within uh, VCP. And that's something you can do, and there can be certain uh, commands uh, and certain routines in the, uh, the post processor that will vary um, the heater, that will vary the compaction pressure automatically. So that once you have identified, um, for for instance, Nomex in this case, um, once you've identified your your allowables there in terms of compaction pressure and, and heater uh, temperature, then um, you can easily accommodate that uh, within VCP. Okay, great. Uh, well, Charlie, we've uh, we've come to the end of our questions, and uh, I want to thank you again for presenting. We appreciate it very much. It was very interesting. Absolutely. Thank you for having me, Jeff. And uh, thanks to our atten attendees as well for taking the time to join us today. We appreciate you being here. And we hope to see you again soon at the next Composites World webinar, which is next week on April 26. For more information on this, please visit the Composites World website. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye.